Welcome to Envision More. Here, we dig deep into the insights of first-generation wealth builders, unearthing stories of passion, resilience, and relentless vision. Your host is Wayne Wagner Jr., founder of Visionary Wealth Management. So sit back and dig in. It's time to Envision More. Welcome to Envision More. I'm Wayne Wagner, president of Visionary Wealth Management. My uh, longtime co-host, Trent Booth, president of Veritas Leadership Group, with me today. And just Trent and I today. No guests, uh, no no, uh, no third parties today, but uh, we are going to be touching on uh, digging into income planning. This is a part of uh, a section of the book, Envisioning More, that's due out uh, in 20, late 2024 is the target for that. Uh, but Trent and I have been talking before we hit play here to uh, talk through kind of how we envision more when it comes to income planning. And uh, Trent, you have a couple of things that maybe emerged early on here. But uh, first of all, thank you for being with me again. It's always good to hang out with you. Uh, it's just to ha- even if we're just if we're recording or not, it's a good t- I'm glad we're choosing to record more. And we can share some of these conversations because you've said things where I'm like, man, I wish this one guy I'm coaching could have heard that. And, mm. and now they can't. So you know, just I recently uh, left the company. I, I would call it retired after 30 years at uh, at one place. Loved it. It was a good income. You started was, when you were nine years old there, right? It was, uh, I literally was, I turned 19 the day I started. And for 30 years, you know, retired at 49, like that's a thing. But I had also incubated another company while I was working there. And part of the challenge isn't just mine there. They, they have a certain amount that they pay for a certain role and they don't go past that. And even if they loved and appreciated that, that contribution, yeah. uh, they, the, all, the alternative to give me more money was to put me in a different position. I had the job I loved. I was coaching and doing leadership development, but that was the ceiling. And I was capped out for about 10 years. And right. Um, right. They, what I loved is that they were giving me some time back where if I worked from home, I could get some of the work done at you mm-hmm. know, maybe some of the, that their work done at night and maybe during the day I could do some coaching. Uh, and side gig, if you will. So that was something that facilitated an ability for me to develop a side right. gig, which became an entrepreneurial opportunity. That's how Veritas yeah. Leadership Group was born. Not yeah. to make this about me, but I know I'm not alone as I'm turning 50 this week. <laughs> People wondering, <laughs> is this all there is? I've got a great thing here, right? If this is all there is, I'm good. But is there something better? Could I envision yeah. more? <laughs> yeah. Gene well, Wayne Wagner. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and, and that's it's a conversation that we have a lot with clients. We have a lot with people in our sphere um, that we have this. We look, we're 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 Westernized, right? We're all, we're born and raised in this Western culture, and in Western culture, we always start these conversations. You know, when when I meet you, Trent, what do you do? Mm-hmm. And there's an identity that comes with that. And you know what? You know what? When you're 87 in a transitional care facility, um, or you're 93, nobody cares what you do. What do, what do you do? I get up in the morning, I'm on the right side of the ground. Thank, thank God. Right. right. So right. it's, it becomes much more about who you are. Um, and, and in, I mean, a, a European, more European mindset, uh, would be, you know, I want to get to know you as a person. Who are you? What do you enjoy? Uh, what what values do we have in common? What what things that do we do that are uh, that we like to uh, in in terms of entertainment and travel and those kinds of things? Culturally, how do we align? Far less about what you do, and so, but in America. Uh, the land of opportunity, uh, also the land of the systematic employee, uh, right? We've, we've yeah. basically taught from a very early age that measure of success is some title that you have, some amount of money yeah. that you're making. And then my industry does this horrible disservice. And I've said this, I say this over and over again, that, hey, what's your number? Um, right. you know, so, so it's because as though, as soon as you hit the number, that it's presumptive that you'll just quit or retire. Right. Yeah, that you'll there's a certain cachet more. associated with a certain uh, career. It starts earlier, Wayne. What school do you go to? What town right. do you live in? <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. And we yeah. start to pull identity from a bunch of things that are external that we may or may not have any control over. Right. Uh, you know, what did I do to get born in Canada in 1974? You know, mm. So I hit the lottery, getting born in this time and space, et cetera. 
Uh, and at the same time, if we are going to lean on those things as our identity, and, and a mentor of mine, Joe Carnuccio, probably about 11 years ago, asked a group of men that same question, you know, who are you? What's your identity? And all of us, even in that context, who I would say is a pretty uh, curated group of self-introspective, you know, guys that were paying attention, looking for growth, et cetera. And everybody wrote down roles. Everybody. I'm a dad. I'm a husband. Uh, mm. I'm a leader. I'm a manager. I'm a doctor. Whatever we put down, all roles. Right, right. And the point is, all of those can change. And what mm -hmm. happens to us if I'm a dad and all of a sudden I'm not? Or I'm a yeah. husband and all of a sudden yeah. I'm not? And the, how rocked we get as men, because if I've put all my eggs in that identity basket <laughs> yeah. and that identity is crushed or gone or altered, uh, yeah. we swoon. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've had clients who have gotten hit either by an unexpected layoff or something sudden that changed in their career. And it's just, it's so jarring that sometimes... Sometimes years later, they're still struggling with anxiety, yeah. depression, fear. They never, you know, frequently will, will not get their feet under them in the next role because they're just not showing up as confident because their identity was in a role and then suddenly it disappeared. It was ripped away from them. And what a and, dichotomy uh, in our, com in our co uh, community because it's really, you mourn that loss. but you're not mm -hmm. allowed to mourn. You're not allowed to feel bad because what? You've right, got some money right. saved and you should be good. Hey, rub some dirt on it. But the dream is dead and you haven't been allowed to properly mourn that, which probably yeah. leads to some of the pandemic we're seeing with regards to mental illness, mental health mm -hmm. challenges, depression, yeah. anxiety, et cetera. Yeah. We're not allowed to process those feelings because uh, you right. should just rub some dirt on it and feel good. All yeah. right. Just shake it that's off. A, that's a good Gen X response. Just rub some dirt on it. Rub some dirt on it, right? Just <laughs> drinking from the garden hose and riding my bike to school with no helmet. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uphill in the snow both Indeed. ways. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. And I mean, that's a, it's a good point, Trent, because I, mean, I think that demographically, you, we've, we talk a lot about demographics, you know, between us and, and even here on the podcast and the way the greatest generation birth, the baby boomers birth, Gen X birth, millennials birth, Gen Z. Um, and, it, you know, like you, you said a number of times, every generation picks on the one behind them. Sure you know, so they do. So the, you know. <laughs> we're not special they've right. got it for generations right yeah the Just greatest yeah. i mean the greatest generation picked on the uh, on the boomers because the boomers were smoking pot and burning their bras the boomers picked on generation x you know that we were the la latchkey kids or you know who uh who didn't have parents at home yeah yeah raised on mtv <laughs> Millennials don't know how to work. Gen Z is completely disconnected and doesn't know how to communicate, has no soft skills. So every generation finds something to pick on the next one behind it. When really, if we're more objective about it, I think we're starting to see, um, you know, when we talk about this thing of work and income and identity, I think we're seeing more healthy dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, and look, Millennials and Gen Z, they're they're at this point in life where they're 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 at this identity point where they don't know quite what success looks like. Right. Yeah. And this is a, this is a conversation we have what we've had with our kids since they were small, right? Which is, hey, when you're in your teens and twenties, you don't know quite what success looks like, but you know what success isn't, and success isn't that coach that screamed and cursed at you. That success is not dad who comes home from work after, you know, and is just killing himself at work and comes home and is, is completely aloof and disconnected and not involved in your life. Um, you know, success is not mom and dad losing each other in the, in, in the, in the, the forays of life and, and, and divorcing while you're in high school. Um, that, so you come to those, the teens and twenties and you're like, I don't know what success is, but I'm not going to do this and I'm not going to do this and I'm not going to do, this. and you come up with that list of, I will not be, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so I think, and I think that's where millennials and Gen Z are today is there, I think they're actually asking much healthier questions because they're looking at the boomers and Gen X in particular right now um, as look, Gen X, we're just, we're just the workhorse, you know, generation, right? So we're in some sense, 45 million Gen X supporting 76 million boomers into retirement and 
Gen X also kind of being the, the gray hair of the group today demographically, where it's Gen X that has 15, 20, 30 years experience and expertise. Like we know how to run the companies that the world is made up of, that the economy is made up of, but there's simply not enough of us mm-hmm. to go around to run the companies because the boomers built the economy and it took 76 million of them to run it. They're now retiring. There's only 45 million Gen X. So there's simply not enough Gen X. So Gen X are, we're, we're busy. Yep. Um, and, you know, and, and, and so millennials are looking at Gen X and going, I don't know what success is, but 60 to 80 hour work weeks not that. <laughs> and no pension yeah. and, you know, and, 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 and having a heart attack at 54 because your body just couldn't take the stress anymore. Oh, by the way, your eating habits, your, all of your, your lifestyle habits all centered around working and identity around work led to the heart attack. That's now shortening your life. So they don't quite know what success is, but it ain't that. Yeah. And so I think millennials and Gen Z are, are you know, combine that with technology that now, gosh, I mean, we know kids that are, you know, we call them social media influencers and we say, the, oh, well, yeah, they're off making TikToks and off making videos and selling products. Yeah, they're selling products, right. getting yeah. paid commissions, making money. Self-employed um, so, 1099. I mean, think yeah. about it what yeah. they're doing here right yeah they just yep. found an opportunity and to step into that which is cool it, it's that's a way of, of celebrating something great about each of those generations because there really is and even within those generations listen not everybody you and i know can run a company so as much mm-hmm. as we generalize we're saying 45 million gen xers right also right. and i would say this too within every single one of those generations there is a special slice right of of that group that is against the norm including gen x including yep. the boomers. Some of the boomers said, I love you to their kids. Okay. <laughs> hopefully more of us Gen Xers are saying it to our kids so that they can say it more to theirs. Uh, hopefully we can advance the plot a little bit, but all that being said is you think about what these generations have. I don't notice a lot of responsibility from the previous generation. So if, if us Gen Xers are a mess, it's because the boomers dropped the ball, I would argue. Okay. Mm-hmm. So like, if we don't like how the millennials are showing up, get involved with some, maybe your own kids and, and see if we can't advance the plot for them. I've worked with millennials directly. So at Cutco, we have primarily college students as recruits and that's who becomes our managers straight out of college. So we're talking young twenties and there are exceptional teenagers today that yes, can look you in the eye, shake your hand and have an amazing conversation. Here's what's different today. They really stand out for those things alone, not even their shoes, which is what I was taught have good shoes in 1993. Right. But now in 2024, if you could just look them in the eye and have a conversation with them, they're like, that kid is amazing. Today yeah. they are. <laughs> and yeah. that counts. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and that's against the backdrop of, of kids who are, you know, we'll call them screen addicted or, or we, we all spend so much time on our screens yeah. that we do tend to lose some of those soft interpersonal emotional skills. Uh, we lose a lot of the, the ability to read nonverbals off of people and things like that. Um, and, and interact with people and, uh, and you intentionally using our nonverbal communication. Yeah. Um, I think well, that generation that's learning how to communicate only with text a lot of the yeah, time. So yeah. even though they could FaceTime, I noticed they don't, they snap, right? right? So, or yeah. they'll, they'll, yeah. so they're just using text to communicate or emojis. Yeah. is a little better, yeah. but it's not like you can read my tone, pitch speed or facial expressions with an emoji right. even. So uh, when it comes to handling conflict, this is one of our great challenges right now is, and it's not just the millennials, Gen Xers too, are trying to handle difficult conversations via email and text. Right. I think, I think uh, that's an interesting point because the, there's an element to which millennials and Gen Z will actually be more emotionally resilient than Gen X because they're used to being able to ask questions, say, Hey, you said this in text, like, but that, there was no nonverbal communication. Like Gen X, right. you say something to me. I read the raised eyebrow. I read the vein throbbing in your throat. I read the, you know, I, I read your nonverbal communication, interpreted that you got an issue here, and now we're going to fight. Um, you know, in Gen Z and, and and millennials, there's a text, and so they they may actually come to the conversation more inquisitive. We're curious. They, they can. And this oh. is where I, I, I argue so much for increasing awareness through journaling. 
because there's mm. an opportunity there, yes, if we disrupt it. But naturally, that's not the case. If Henry mm. David Thoreau was saying 100 years ago that most men lead lives of quiet desperation and go to the grave with a song still in them. Mm. If he lived today, I think he'd look around at a street, screen addicted bunch and he'd say, most men lead lives of desperate distraction. Mm. Yeah. And we're not thinking. In fact, we're desperately working hard to not think. The reason we'll look at our phone right until we shut our eyes to sleep is if we don't want to think, we don't want to look up at the ceiling and contemplate the stars, my life, what's happening, right. uh, my mistakes, learn from them, et cetera. So the introspection is lacking America in a lot of the generations, not just the you know, millennials, you know, <laughs> stay, stay up at night considering. You know, <laughs> but for us to process those feelings, there is an opportunity because there is more conversation around mental health. There's more conversation around yeah. becoming aware and talking through therapy, et cetera, is mm -hmm. losing the stigma. So I see some wonderful trends if we can continue mm -hmm. to accelerate those. But again, even us Gen Xers, we look at people going through that. You're like, dude, my parents got divorced and then I got divorced. I didn't go through therapy and I'm fine. But are you? Yeah. yeah <laughs> it's a fair yeah. question. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> I had a, a conversation with a, I had a conversation with a client this past week who, who um, his, in his extended family, there was a, a husband and wife who watched something really traumatic happen. And they're, you know, a decade, decade and a half removed from it. But he said, you know, you can, you can today, you can see the emotional scars because neither one of them went to a day of therapy yeah. and each of them have substantial malformations and how they show up and present. Yeah. Um, dad's the big gregarious goofball, always making a joke, covers up at, at everything. You know, yeah. mom shows up and she just looks like she just... You know, she's just carrying the weight of the world on her and it's just and this is just the way these folks show up all the time and it it really goes you can go back to the singular horrible traumatically bad mm -hmm. um but it's it's um yeah and we all we we have those things right so i mean we we we, we all have trauma mm -hmm. <clears throat> how have we handled it how have we did we just try to rub emotional dirt on it and or I mean, the world I grew up in slap a couple of, you know, what, what, you know, partially phrased or, you know, Bible verses on it. And, uh, and, and, and you just keep moving forward. Right. Or platitudes um, just keep moving, you know, right. Just, yeah. it's not, just, just you know. keep swimming. Yeah. We, te right. we teach that. And, you know, we yeah. taught that in finding Nemo, right? Finding Nemo, swimming. Right. So, you know, when I grew up uh, with my, my chiropractor had a Confucian saying with a, a tree that was all twisted and bent, it said, as the twig is bent, so grows the tree. Hmm. And I love this because it absolutely informs precisely what you're describing here, right? So if we don't handle it on our terms, we will deal with it on its terms. So I had a therapist, uh, we had lost our second child in a row uh, to the miscarriage in between our first and our second common, but I didn't even know that, that this was a thing. I, right, miscarriage right. is not on our radar as a possibility, right? Oh, yeah, now we have yeah. two in between, we're wondering if we can even have kids. So I'm in mm -hmm. therapy because I ran out of tools to deal. And he says to me, if I throw a if you're standing waist deep in a pool and I throw a couple tennis balls and say, keep these underwater. If I throw one every 10 seconds, he goes, the first minute you're okay. Six balls, you can keep those under. But by minute five, those start to pop up and they're yeah. going to keep popping up. And as you scramble to save one, five more come up. Right. And that's how undealt with trauma, right? Mm. Unaddressed trauma. Yeah. will emerge like that in different ways. And it's yeah. not a matter of if, it's a matter of, of when. So way better to deal with it on our terms as opposed to kind of leaving it on its own. So let's tie that into that that kind of linear progression of born, educate, work, retire, die. I mean, we've, you, we use that progression in the West um, and, we'll, and we'll dig into the demographics and how de different demographies or, or groups of uh, people within our society are handling some of that. But you just touched on something because, you know, is it the fact, do we, and, and, and has my industry, the financial planning industry, leaned into this to a fault to do more damage by saying, hey, you know, Trent, you're not getting, you know, effectively, what we're not saying is, Trent, you've got all this trauma, you've had all these things happen, you haven't dealt with them. But your identity is your work. Right, right. And so therefore, work yeah. must be the problem. Right. right. But what we really need to do is you need to save as much as you can. And you need to follow this financial plan to get to some imaginary number so that you can retire because then your trauma will stop popping up like the tennis balls because w work will be over. Yeah. 
And what's completely false about that is, A, you have not dealt with any of the trauma. Now you're just going to be retired with all the time in the world to look up at the ceiling and think about the stuff that could have been or should have been dealt with. If your parents, if your kids want to hang out with you, cats in the yeah. cradle, right? Cat Stevens, yeah. right? Yeah. So now like, Hey dad, I'm, I'm doing what you did. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Nice talking yeah. to you, dad, you know, <laughs> you know, regret is, is if we yeah. call those when, and then people, right. When I do this, then I'll, Hey, when we hit a million in net worth, mm-hmm. then I'll hang out with the kids more. Yeah. Like, well, will, will the kids want to hang out with you? Right. Because right. you weren't there. And that's a fair question now. Yeah. Well, and, and I think, you know, even worse in all of that, we're going to get you to a number so that you can retire. But for the last 40 years, your identity has been work and now you're going to have no identity now because you don't have work anymore. Yeah. yeah. The one thing keeping you going, we just took that away. Yeah. (laughs) So why do, why do retirees, yeah. Why do retirees get divorced? Yeah. You know, mom and dad got, mom and dad got married. They had kids. They raised the kids. They lost each other in the fray, but they stayed yeah. together for the kids or because they couldn't afford to reti- you know, divorce or whatever. Well, now mm-hmm. the wage earner retires, comes home, and now you got to stare at each other and put up with each other all day, every day yeah. with yeah. no identity for the wage earner, with un- dealt with trauma. I mean, we're, we're like, and we've created this. We're, do- we're two or three generations deep. And that's why I say, I think, yeah. I do think millennials and Gen Z are, they're asking healthier questions about, okay, I don't know what success is, but it ain't this. Right. Right. Um, so yeah, we actually get commended and affirmed because our youngest is graduating high school in a few weeks and she wants to be an artist and she's wildly talented. Now I would argue technology today, it's never been easier to sell, to take your goods to market mm-hmm. and sell your digital products, et cetera. Of course, AI does threaten a bit of that, but here's what I'm getting at is we celebrate her being able to do that. And it's not all about, the money it's not even all about security we we believe she's going to be fine she'll be provided for she'll be all right she'll be able to figure her way through and also there's more things to life than hitting quote unquote a number why don't we live well while right. you know also working towards our dreams yeah well living well but also i mean the financial planning conversation so like so much traditional financial planning is all right well between 50 and 55 your kids are going to mature out of the house. And even if they did come home from college for a few years, by your late fifties, on average, you're getting the kids out of the house, off the couch, you're there through, through college, you're getting them out of the house, that kind of thing. And so, Hey, we've got three, five, 10 years to accumulate as much as we can to get to our number. And look, statistics are real. You know, it took you X number of years to get the first million, but the second million comes so much quicker because the first million's helping you get the second, you know, and the second and, and the third one comes quicker and the fourth one comes quicker. Um, getting that first million is the single biggest hurdle we all face. Um, but time will take care of that. But we're so focused on accumulate, accumulate, save, save, get to the number so I can quit. Yeah. What if we asked a different question? Hmm. What if, what if, Oh, by the way, we're doing all that against the backdrop of, you know, kind of up or out in corporate life. I have to get promoted to my next title or like I'm just not progressing in my career Mm -hmm. Uh, or I can't. And I certainly couldn't take a step backward in the organizational chart to a job that I loved, Mm -hmm. maybe in an area of the country that I loved maybe with working with people that I really got fired up to be with. Hmm. I can't do that because it's up or out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, you know, and I think you, you, you personally, that 10 year kind of plateaued income wise with vector, but that's, that's an anomaly. We don't see that as much. Right. Well, actually the choice, because I, I turned out other opportunities that I knew was going to take more time. Right. So for me, and I I think here's, what's interesting. I'm not the only one doing this now saying no to more money. So that I don't have to miss a varsity game, for example. Right. right? So there were certain things I wanted to do that uh, I knew there was going to be boots to fire uh, requirement, right. To step into that role. And I said no to it. So I was 
although I didn't love the being plateaued income wise, I would say that the trade off for me was it was a reasonable uh, trade off. Right. The other part of that is making sure I had enough margin so that I'm still connecting with Christy so that, yeah, when all the kids are out of the house, we got yeah. something more to talk about still. Right. And enjoy those next few years. The question that we're getting to, though, is, all right, if, if we're just living and just grinding for today, we're not going to get as great a result as if we are thinking beginning with the end in mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, pre-recording, you and I were talking about the, the, the golf swing. If, and I'm terrible at golf still, golfed 49 times last year, you'd think I'd be better. But when I swing at the ball, if I swing up to the ball and just, just up to the ball, it always goes terribly, terribly. If I'm thinking of swinging through the ball, and that affects actually the backswing, if I'm thinking of swinging through on the four, right? And th that same concept needs to be towed into, I think, our daily living here, which is I've got to think beyond more, just not this next year or five years. What is the end here? What is What do I want at the end of that dash for people yeah. to say at the funeral? What do I want? Not just, hey, he, he arrived at his number <laughs> and left a lot of money to his kids. He lived well. Yeah. yeah. You know? Well, and I think that, you know, that, that swinging through the ball and golf, swinging through the number, everybody wants to swing to the number so they can retire. Yeah. But if we start to think about identity, Hey, listen, one of the, one of the happiest people I know to this day is one of my clients who could have retired probably a decade ago. Hmm. Um, he took a job that was, so he was, he was a, um, a VP in marketing and, and, and sales in a big pharma environment. He's now VP of marketing for a startup like micro company. Hmm. He could do this job in his sleep yeah, yeah. compared to what he was, what he was doing 15 years ago. Hmm. But man, he loves the work. He loves the work. He loves the people he he's doing it with. It takes him 15 to 25 hours on average. Yeah. He's well into his 60s and sees, has no reason to quit. And when right. you talk to him, he is just happy. Right. He's just now he was always a happy guy. Sure. But I see so many people who go through some kind of emotional shift. And what am I going to do with myself? Wait, just, can you imagine that people at the company that guy works at getting access to that guy? You don't, you can't find right. those guys. You can't manufacture them. You can't buy them. Having a guy like that on your team, even if he's right. only putting in 15 hours a week, that's the best 15 hours of, I would want to be at the office during those moments. Right. I'd work remote and I'd be there anytime he's in the office. But right. you think about the value, the wealth of knowledge that those guys have, get plenty of gas in the tank, enthusiasm yeah. for what we're doing. But a lot of us, you know, if you think about younger entrepreneurs that are running companies, could they get access to a guy like that, even fractionally? Right. So in the coaching right. space, I'm seeing more show up as like a fractional CFO or as a mm -hmm. fractional leadership officer, you know, hey, we're a startup, mm -hmm. we're doing 5 million and none of, none of us are over 40. You right. know, what right. if we had a guy that was 62, like you're describing an industry yeah. expert who's been down this path, knows what's yeah. going on and we could go, are we crazy? He might go, well, I, I like what you're doing here. What about this though? Or if he just says, not only are you not crazy, run, how valuable yeah. is that yeah. contribution to a corporate America right now? Well, and, here, and, and here's like selfishly on the financial planning side, is it better for you to have an extra million dollars saved by age 55 so that you, and, and quit sure. or is a better long-term financial planning decision for you to be able to work 55 to 65 doing something you care about? Right, right. Something way, about way better decision for you to do something. And, and here's the secret. While you're in that, you know, age 25 to 55 range, you're thinking about raising kids, college, paying down a mortgage, accumulating wealth, 55 plus, hey, you don't have to max out your 401k. Mm. You don't have three or four colleges to pay and two weddings to pay for. Yep. You know, you're moving through that stuff. The mortgage is way mortgage smaller, gone, right? You know, yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, or or, or your gone. mortgage might be done by fifty five. Yeah, <laughs> so um, probably not today with seven and a half percent interest rates, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> refi, good times. But, yeah, well, I mean, we'll be done. And again, a lot of the cars are paid off. I'm like, wow, that's right. crazy. And the university's done. You're like, okay, so now actually, uh, half of X monthly that nut. Right is good. I, I couldn't yeah. spend all the money I was earning back then today. Right? Yeah. And, and because the, the other side of it is what, what people are missing is that when you're doing something, first of all, if you're doing something you love, 
with people you care about and respect yeah. for yeah. people you love, It'll get better. Yeah. you're going to be able to do it longer. Mm-hmm. Physically, scientifically, you're going to live longer because you're living like, uh, like yeah. this. Yeah. Um, because you're, you're, you're happier. Like my friend, Ed, you're, you're, you're happier. A whole um, book on this, the happiness advantage for our listeners. Yeah. Can't recommend that one enough. They scientifically prove what we know to be true, which is those who love what they do, do better work, make mm-hmm. more profit, right? The company thrives, you enjoy it, you live longer and it's right. better quality life. There's mm-hmm. no argument against doing what you love. I would say this, if you're, tr- if you're trading a piece of an unrenewable resource, your life, time you better love what you do and we better ask a question more than what am i making it better be what am i becoming yeah and if i don't love the answer to that i've got to make a decision to change fast yeah and and there's there's going to be there's going to be balance here right so the the conversation that i have with you know somebody who's maybe 50 years old but they they do have enough to retire retire or be financially independent like they really don't have to work again, the rest of their life, they're not going to spend the money that they've got. Yeah. The question then is, Hey, are you, you know, we, t- we talk a lot about calling versus stewardship, right? Mm. So what, what, um, and we, I think we've talked about that in some other episodes where we're, you know, what if you could work a few more years and really accelerate your kid's wealth mm. or, you know, go find somebody who's got passion or calling for some kind of a missional self-sacrificial type role and help that person help fund that person for the rest of their career. Um, I'm doing that, you know, this year with my brother um, Mm -hmm. and who is um, going to make a shift. He, now he's a guy who's called everything about him is ministry. It's, counseling, therapy, yeah. coaching, pastoring, teaching, you know, yeah. re- religious studies. It's, it's all on the, the spiritual, you know, at calling least three right. different fronts. I'm aware of it, the ripples that he's making will, will go on for so forever. Yeah. And he won't even be aware of all those ripples because a lot of them aren't tracked <laughs> like you and I get right. to track our results. Right. So he's in it truly for the love of the game, not yeah. for notoriety, not for glory. He's yeah. in it because he, he's called to your point, right? Yeah. yeah. And the shift that he's making right now, I believe is going to make a global dent as opposed yeah. to, you know, a regional. A, and that local one, by the way, that's enough. But also, right. what an exciting uh, season here for Nate. Yeah, it, it is. And, and, and so that's, that's an area where I'm thinking this way, that my, like, part of my own construct is, hey, I have no intention to retire. And I'm not saying that they're going to ca- have to carry me out of the office um, <laughs> it, on, a, on a gurney, but you'll be in what, I'm sa- the beach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, I, what I'm saying is that um, part of my own framework and three-dimensional thinking is, hey, my ability to work it, it, and, and generate revenue can enable others who have a calling, who have a mm. gift set, who yeah. have a, a desire to help others. And I get to vicariously mm. live through and live into that 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 global positive dent that'll be made by that called person mm. because I'm kind of the supply lines. Yeah. And so I get to participate okay. in that um, because I'm the supply. And look, I, I view the supply lines as kind of less important than the ministry piece right? Um, or the calling piece. I, I would argue it doesn't um, happen without the supply line. Uh, yeah, and even what I use for this is sponsor. And, and here's what I'm saying. Go, uh, yeah. Celebrate the fact that you sponsor, not just with the dollars. You know, you truly do get in there in the soil with them and help them dream map it, help them envision what it could be. Yeah. And even some of us will come to you and be like, ah, I'm thinking about this. And you're waving the pom-poms. Yes. <laughs> yes, yeah. this is a thing. And you're asking questions, not just rooting them on, but asking questions like, all right, what would it take for you to right. be able to do this? In fact, what would the ripples be? What could it be if yeah. we're to do this as well? So I love the fact that you're you're promoting this. And again, part of when you said, hey, I'm going to do a podcast, I'm like, boy, that's a lot of time. It's that worth Wayne's time is, I think, a fair question. It is in my mind if we're helping more people think about, hey, I mm-hmm. love foster care. I'm not sure if we're at a time in our lives 
uh, or a season where we would foster personally, but we really care about this. We'd like to sponsor this. We'd like to right. support that, whether it's a ministry or, or, or a couple or a family, et cetera. But the idea of coming alongside with that that does change everything, doesn't it? Even if yeah. you're just a spot quote, just a sponsor, you said live vicariously. There's joy. There is no question, intrinsic value in you doing something like that. And not just you, but helping others to see themselves. You know what? I think we are going to get involved with that. We've got the dollars. Let's go. Yeah. 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 And I think, uh, you know, because what we start to do then is we're starting to peel apart this onion of identity as employment right? Identity is title. Well, what are you? Well, I'm executive director of, I'm VP of, I'm executive, you know, I'm C level, uh, you know, so we, we, so much of that identity that, you know, look there, there, it'll be part of the obituary, right? Right. But your kids don't care what the title was. They don't care. They don't care. And did you hug me today? They don't care if you went to Harvard to give me a Harvard hug. Yeah. They just want the hug. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and 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 I, I mean, I and I've lived that so personally because you know, in in my own journey, um, like my dad wasn't a guy who had titles, and yeah. so he would come home and and you know, as kids, we didn't we, we probably didn't respect him the way we should in in many cases, and and some of that was just us being some of it was me, us being kids, some of us was it probably it. Us young man not, syndrome. Yeah. yeah, young man syndrome. But <laughs> but then, you know, and, and so I determined, well, I'm going to have, I, I'm going to be a guy who earns respect and, and gets titles or or gathers influence. And so I go out and I, I study and become someone who, hey, by the time I'm in my early 30s, I'm walking into the room with people worth eight figures and uh, giving instruction and I'm respected and revered for my right. opinion. I'm carrying influence. And I come home to my 12 year old son and he's still treating me like crap. And, 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 and I'm like, you know, well, well, what have I done? Well, I've fallen into the identity trap. I've fallen into that trap of, do you know, son, do you know who I am? I'm an important person. <laughs> Out, I'm an important person outside these walls. Yeah. You're also the dad I haven't seen all week. Yeah. Yeah. And I've got my own stuff going on at school. I'm being bullied and you don't even have enough communication and connectivity like you don't even know that that's going on and for me it was worse dad you're chairman of the board you've got this title as chairman of the board Mm. and you don't know that i'm being bullied in the school that you chair the board for Mm. and so friction emerges but what what, what's that all that's all downstream trauma to my son because of my identity problems because I'm identifying my identity as well, I'm chairman of the board. I'm president of X. I'm owner of Y. Um, and then, you know, so, so it's, it's an identity issue. Um, and then, you know, ultimately for us, the school closes and, you know, hey, you're no longer president or, or chairman of, you know, yeah. oh, wow. Well, you know, who, who am, am I? I? Oh, well, I'm still president <laughs> of visionary wealth management. You know, I'm still, you know, here I am still clinging to titles, right? So. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, hopefully what happens over time is that we figure out, hey, life is better lived if we just show up and try to add value. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, I think, and, and there's, uh, there, there's some other, uh, like some of the older books, like, you know, the Fred Factor and, and some of those kinds of books where it's as somebody who's in a innocuous, not, you know, not revered position is actually having huge impact on the way businesses are run because of how they show up yep. and uh, you know, and, and they're not, they're not uh, I think one of the groups that we're affiliated with professionally is triad partners. And one of their core values is check ego at the door. Like yep. don't show up with a, do you know who I am? Do you right. know what my production was? Do you know how big yeah. my team is? Leading with a number. Here's my AUM. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Here's my new business number. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's and, tough. and so, you know, check ego at the door says, and, and then, you know, we've kind of adopted that internally at visionary wealth management to, Hey, you know, if you've got, if somebody's messing up, if somebody's not living in alignment with our core agreed on mm-hmm. values, um, then like we don't bring it up in front of everybody, you know, it's, it's praise in public discipline and private. Right. <laughs> so it's still, you know, the way you handle your kids. Um, but you know, take somebody behind closed doors and say, Hey, Wayne, you're, you're, 
you're not showing up the way at least I expect you to based on this shared value or at least. Yeah. We made an yeah. agreement when, when yeah. you came to the table, this is what it means. And and you're outside of that agreement now. And that yeah. accountability is love. I would, I would agree with that. If we've submitted to that, then that, that makes sense to actually, if you care about me, <laughs> you're following up and making sure that I'm living in alignment with my core value in yeah. that moment, you know, but you think about what opens up when we, when we make different choices like that, people are going to think there's like promotional consideration paid for by the following, like, family brand like because we've uh, referenced yeah, it yeah. quite a bit right, but right. that work i wish that we had we did a lot of the work separately before we had an actual program or, or curriculum yeah. to run through but yeah. you and i were both intentional with our kids based on probably questions we wish that our parents asked you know yeah. earlier in life and and uh, my kid would say things like dad why don't we have uh why don't we have a mustang i'd be like well buddy i put it in the private school i could just make choices we could have a mustang but i think we made a good investment right. what do you think bud right you know and, oh yeah and also travel hockey at your goalie so yeah we could have had like two mustangs right and uh, i think we made the right call here but yeah. helping him understand why we're making the decisions and not saying by the way what i heard when i was a kid i just said why don't we have the uh the t-bird you know the firebird and that you know we're too poor, you know, uh, we don't, we can't afford it. I'm like, yeah. well, it looks like yeah. we can afford other stuff. <laughs> we afford eating out and can't afford a car though. All right. Well, here, here's, here's, your, here's your envision more moment trend. So <laughs> back to that moment. Um, if you were a self-employed, if you own your own LLC and we're generating revenue here at that point, you would pay Jake 12,000 a year and then he would pay his own private school tuition. So right, there's a, there's right. a tack pack. Uh, know, so, so. I hate that I learned that this year from you. It was like, man, I needed that 10 years ago. I did. Our kids are almost all done, but like, yes. Okay. At least the second best time was right now. I want you to say it again. Wait, just in case the listeners missed this one, pay okay. the kid <laughs> through the yeah, LLC. Yeah. So you can pay, if you have an LLC, you can pay your child up to $13,000 a year. They have to have actual roles and responsibilities. OK, um, so you have to have a list of things that but you come up with that list. They have to attend uh, family business meetings. They have to you know, they have to t check the mail, take the trash out, do, do their chores that are affiliated associated with the family business. The, the, the trash in the office needs to get taken out. Um, Gen Y is uh, Gen Z, whatever they are. They're good at social media. So I've got. Bad yeah. Bad yeah. You can buy yeah. posts for me and stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you could pay the child up to $13,000 a year. They don't have to file a tax return, but the income is tax deductible to mm -hmm. the business. So multiply that by how many kids you got. Uh, suddenly the Duggar family isn't paying any taxes. And uh, but you know, you, so you do that and then the child pays for their own when there's hockey expenses, the kid pays it for themselves. Um, the, if there's other forms of, um, expenses as, as private school, uh, expenses, things like that, they, pay, they can pay that tuition themselves. Um, and if there's money left over in that, you can, they now have earned income. Your 12 year old has earned income. And so you can set up a Roth IRA and start accelerating their wealth. Um, longer term, and it's all tax deductible to the LLC. So that's uh, you know, check with your tax accountant. You know, and proper disclosure in, 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 involved here, but uh, yeah. and I don't have know, a time machine to go back ten years ago for me, but we're on yeah. podcast. Well, you know, <laughs> right? so it, next best thing is today, friends. All right, so some of you are me ten years ago. <laughs> Trent, you know, the the, the the really dirty secret is that my kids are nineteen and twenty two, and we didn't start doing this until they were eighteen. Like we really didn't, we didn't do it ourselves until my daughter went to college. My daughter went to college. That was when I picked my head up and said, Hey, she's going to be nickel and diamond me every month for expenses. Right. Yeah. Meanwhile, I can give her some responsibilities even remotely yeah. and I'll put her on payroll. And I actually put her on W2 payroll um, right. so that she could also start putting money into a, into a Roth for 401k inside yeah. the business. But I didn't, I didn't do it for myself until, and, and I like, I knew this. I like I, I wasn't living it, but I like I consciously had this information for yeah. years. Yeah. Part of it for us was was slogging through those years of of being thin and and uh, you know supporting the school and that kind of stuff. Sure. But uh, yeah. so it was a lot of it was cash flow related for right. us, right? Um, and not just you. I mean, that's, that's most of us is the reality. Yeah. And that's yeah. you know one of the fascinating things to me is that we, we usually expand to fill the space and that includes finances. If you yeah. give myself two hours to pack, I'll take two hours to pack. I give myself 10 minutes. I miraculously get done. Yeah. But the idea of, right. I've just, cause I've got, it doesn't mean I know it is another right. concept here too. Like I, right. I have conscious, if I have conscious awareness, I could take action. And that's yeah. the miracle piece. You know, it's really do, am I even aware? 
So there's a ton of ideas like that, though, Wayne, that yeah. we've got to merge over time here. What's uh, If we get to the end of our time here, Wayne, what's some uh, parting thoughts here that we want to make sure that we close with for sure? I think uh, on the envisioning more side, here, here's one additional thought specifically to this this idea of let, let, let's start rethinking how we approach income and how we approach identity. Um, a lot, a higher and higher percentage of our clients are finding success doing consulting, mm. uh, kind of work really hard for a corporation, do the up or out thing, but then get to a point where it's, hey, I'm just not going to, I want to go, I, I want more of my life back. And the company's just not going to give me my time. Uh, and and they won't let me take two steps back into a job I can do in 30 hours a week right, yeah. and actually yeah. add way more value than when I was trying to learn that job working 80 hours a week because yeah. now I can do it in 30 and do it three times better. Heck, I can probably do it three times better than the guy who's doing it now. Yes. Uh, so yes. because I've got all this expertise, but companies won't buy that. But what they will do is they'll pay me as a consultant to come in for 15 hours a week yeah. to help that person do the job. Um, and so, you know, we have a, an increasing percentage of our clients who are doing that. Um, that's not just the gig economy. That is a demographic absolute necessity today because yeah. of boomers retiring. Gen X has the gray hair. Millennials yeah. and Gen Z have the manpower, but not mm -hmm. the experience. Yeah. And so for uh, companies to, you know, they, Companies have to do, have to make a choice demographically. They can hire a millennial to do the job and accept the mistakes that are, come, are going to come with it while the person learns the job. Yeah. Or they can marry that millennial with a coach, marry that millennial with a consultant, somebody who's got some more gray yeah. hair, who's done the job to help minimize. Yeah. And an it's, internal mentor, yes. Yep, yep. So companies will do all of that when we change that trajectory and we don't, we stop thinking about it, well, it's got to be up or out, or it's got to be go, 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 stop. Yeah. Yeah. We do some, there's some magical things that start to happen. So first of all, when we're willing to do or able to do a job longer as a financial planner, that's fewer years that I have to figure out how to fund. Right. Yeah. And guess what? Yeah. You actually need less money accumulated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're going to work and earn income, here's another really, really important factor here. When you're making $500,000 a year, salary, benefits, long-term incentives, bonuses, commissions, whatever it is, you're making $500,000 a year. You're safe. Hopefully you're working with a good advisor. They're, they're arm wrestling some of that money out to save. Right. Clawing some back. Yeah. But you're living up to that income. Right. In some way, if we move you into a consulting role where you're working 25 hours a week and you're making 200000 a year, right. you're not doing the saving, sure. but what happens to the lifestyle? You the lifestyle naturally, unintentionally right? yeah. starts yeah. to exhale a little bit. Yeah. Instead of buying a car every year, you might drive this one a little longer. Right. right, might not need another phone right this year when the new one comes out, right? And job. we're yeah, and we're thinking three dimensionally about taxes because now we're a business owner and yeah. there's lots of other things that we oh. can think about and do in terms of yeah. tax management. Well, what does that do when it comes to the financial plan? Well, if as a financial planner, if I have less years I have to fund, mm -hmm. and the income expectation or the cost of living has come down a little bit. All of that is taking pressure off the number. You know, we have to get the number. We have to get the number. Right. And it All creates margin, which allows right. now if right. your grandma or grandpa, which I've got friends already, you know, at this age that are grandma and grandpa would love to visit the kids that yes, have moved away. Right. So yep. now if you're working 25 hours a week and you can do that in Indianapolis, why not right. go visit the grandkids? Now you've got freedom and flexibility in a That's way that right. you've never considered. Yep. You know, when I'm celebrating this, I'm here two things in particular. One is if you're listening to this, you're an employee, you're not stuck. You've got options that you may yeah. not have considered. You might need a change of address. There might be options within your current company. If you're a business owner, don't be afraid to get creative. <laughs> I, full disclosure, I forgot this part until you mentioned it. Cutco 
I retired there, but then they hired me back as a contractor mm. <laughs> to do some of the same work I was doing before, which is awesome. Right. Cost them way less. I'm not an employee anymore. They're not covering you know, right. Medicare, et cetera. So it's a good deal for them. Great deal for me on yep. both sides. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I should tell this story as well. My grandfather worked for 42 years for Procter and Gamble. He loved selling. He loved selling and passed up opportunities to go into management because he wanted to deal with his accounts all over mm. Western uh, Canada. And uh, the company was smart enough to not force him into a management position, a management role that he wasn't going to enjoy. That right. traditionally is the only way to pay this guy more. Well, they found a way to creatively pay him more and they used him as a mentor. So if they're going to groom the next president for Korea, they had him field train with Doug Coom and go on the road and see how to sell mm. with Doug Coom. So they used him as a mentor in the company. Mm and found a way to creatively retain him and keep him what he was awesome at. His contribution was going to be far greater in that role right. than if they right. forced him into a, a division manager type position. So, yeah. you know. And yet, you, what, uh, what do 98% of companies do with a good salesman? Oh, we uh, need to have you managing other salesmen. You got it. Right. And the skills aren't the same. And okay. I've, I know a many great people that are exceptional salespeople. You should keep that exceptional animal on its track. <laughs> you yeah, let yeah. them do what they do. They don't come around very often. Find creative ways to compensate them so you keep them. And right. they might even make more than the person managing them. I have no problem with that, by the way. Right. That's not right. a new concept. But Well, I, and I think you, you and I have also had a, some conversations about people who are in sales who are making a lot of money and they don't know why. Right. So they're, they're, they're almost, so they're feeling a sense of maybe a lack of fulfillment that, Hey, I can do this, but this is like riding a bike. I can do this every day and keep pumping out money. Mm -hmm. But for what? And that's where that's one of the things areas I hope that this podcast is enabling people to envision more to say, hey, look, if you are one of those wealth generators, yeah. if you're somebody who knows how to generate capital, generate income, go find yourself a couple of people who are called. Go find yourself yeah. an organization or two that's filled with people who are making a positive dent in the universe and you start being the supply lines. Yeah. You want a why. You start seeing the downhill, downstream impact of your contributions to an organization that's making a positive event in the universe, you'll get up and be more fired up to go to work and generate revenue yeah. again. Yeah. Um, now so. now it counts, right? Now there's yeah. relevance yeah. to the work. Now there's a reason to get up and grind. It's because it's more than just me. Right. Right. My contribution goes way more than just this workplace here. It goes to support foster yeah. the family, whatever it is that we're doing there. Yeah. Be a sponsor. Yeah. I love this. That is part of Envision More, Wayne. And that's why I celebrate the work that we're doing here. Let's just uh, keep jamming. Let's keep going. That's great. Trent, thanks for your time today. Thanks for joining right. me again, as always. I'd love uh, digging into this stuff. And I hope uh, you as listeners, I hope you've learned uh, some, uh, heard some things that are valuable for you. Uh, VisionaryWealth.com, EnvisionMore.com. Veritas Leadership Group dot com. Am org. I doing that? Not, dot org. Not Veritas you got it. Leadership Group dot org. Um, so uh, please feel free to hit up Trent or myself uh, if we can add value and support you in any way. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Envision More podcast with Wayne Wagner Jr. of Visionary Wealth Management. We hope you were encouraged and inspired by the conversation today. If you want to dig deeper into the show notes or Wayne's work at Visionary, you can find us at envisionmore.com. That's Envision with a Z. Advisory services are provided through Wealth Plan Investment Management. Wealth Plan Investment Management and Visionary Wealth Management are separate entities. The content is developed from sources believed to be providing accurate information. The information in this material is not intended as tax or legal advice. Please consult legal or tax professionals for specific information regarding your individual situation. The opinions and material provided are for general information and should not be considered a solicitation for the purchase or sale of any security. Thanks for listening.